All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Wednesday's herpetology class. This is like the most bittersweet day of the week, right? Because, because you have herpetology class today, but then you don't have herpetology for like five more days. You have to go through like the whole weekend without being in this room with all of us and seeing pictures of turtles and all that. So let's make the best of it today. Uh, I want to recognize that we should be out seeing mud puppies today and we're not. It's the second time we've had to cancel the trip. Such it is with field work and, and, and wild animals. Um, we do our best to plan things in advance and uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The plan is to reschedule probably sometime uh, later in this month, if not early March. Ryan, the graduate student from OSU, is out doing field work until April. So at some point in the semester, we'll get out there. My hope was that we could start off the class right away getting out to the field to see some stuff in the wild. Hasn't worked out. The only thing really active right now in terms of reptiles and amphibians in Ohio is going to be those mud puppies. Um, so once the weather starts to warm up, we'll be able to have some other opportunities. But for right now, we just got to sit tight and uh, be here with our friends. Uh, on that note, I want to make sure we all uh, recognize, uh, what did you call him, Sid? New teacher guy? Oh, yeah, do, okay, yeah. So this is Dr. Andrew Mason. You remember him from our very first online class. He is a postdoc at, uh, um, at Ohio, The Ohio State University. And he is going to lead the next couple of weeks of classes uh, after today, specifically talking about venom and venom evolution. And this is super cool for all of you and for me because I don't know very much about venom and venom evolution. So I am gonna be here uh, learning along with everybody. And that's uh, really exciting to be able to do that. So we're excited to welcome uh, Dr. Mason to the class. He's gonna sit in today and just kind of hang out, maybe throw tomatoes or whatever if things go sour we'll see uh you can be like those guys in the muppet show you know maybe you and princeton can sit in the back and just make yeah yeah statler and waldorf are their names yeah 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 um don't do that though yeah it's... so that's the that's the plan for today now i want to recognize too you have a class program uh, i gave to you on monday but it's not due until the following monday because i assume we won't be in the classroom today so just keep that in mind there's no new program but all of that stuff is still on the docket for Monday. Before we jump into what we're doing today, what questions do you have for me? Yes, Sam. Yeah. Where are you turning? So there is a, at the bottom of the PDF, there's a link uh, to submit a, a, a Google Doc form. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you'll, you'll do the assignment in a Google Doc and then you'll send that to me via this link which then you just cut and paste the link into the Google Doc and that way I'll have it all in one place. It just makes my life way easier instead of like emailing it to me or something, keeps it organized. And actually, well, let me, we'll talk more about that in just a second too. Other questions? All right, so today's agenda looks like this. It's a little bit of a hodgepodge because I thought we were on a field trip today, but I'm actually pretty excited about what, it, what it's gonna be. The first thing is gonna be something called cold lizards. Um, we're going to take a look at some lizards that are really cold. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, I want to review some concepts from Monday's class. I gave you a ticket out and I asked you some questions. And I just want to review those because I got um, kind of inconsistent answers on some of those. So I want to just review that with everybody. And then I'm going to finish up our series of lectures on reptile diversity. I promised the best for last. So today is turtle day, uh, very excitingly. And then we have cold lizards part two, which is like the sequel to cold lizards part one. But this is actually, I should, this is a misnomer. That should actually be not so cold lizards. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then we're gonna spend the last part of class doing something we don't normally do, but that is having some open work time, uh, specifically on your primary literature assignment where you can get started, you can make sure things are making sense. And if you have questions, um, I'm here, Prince is here, Dr. Mason's here, we can answer questions and help out. If you're golden and you feel like you're good to go, well, then you can be good to go, and that's fine. We'll spend the last part of class doing that. I want to remind us that this class, I did, I actually did the math the other day, and I realized that we meet for 220 minutes a week, where most, most one-unit classes meet for three lectures um, at 50 minutes a lecture, so they meet for like 150 minutes a week. So we actually have a little bit of class time to play with where you can be flexible. And I was thinking about the best way to use that, and I was thinking that, you know, like a workshop kind of session or something like that, would be a good way for you to make sure you're getting what you need and then also not kind of overwhelm us with like 
I mean, as much as herpetology is cool, we don't necessarily need to overwhelm all of our schedules with that. So that's the plan. And then we just kind of got some wrap ups at the end. And actually, I'll probably do the wrap ups first. So that way, if you want to bail for the workshop. Questions you have? All right, Princeton, do you want to instigate, uh, inst instigate, this is the signal, when you said we would have a signal for when you should get the lizards. Um, what's a good gesture for getting cold lizards? When the, the, what Ethan's doing, yeah. It's cold lizard time. All right, all right. Great, thanks for that suggestion, Ethan. I appreciate that. <laughs> it was not the one that I had in mind, but. Uh, so Princeton's going to be back in just a minute with some cold animals. And while he's doing that, uh, I'm just going to continue talking for a second. So part of what we'll cover in this class is overwintering of reptiles and amphibians. As I mentioned um, earlier, the only thing we're going to see active right now in around here is going to be mud puppies that I know of anyway. And so that means that all of the reptiles and amphibians are somewhere really cold and hibernating for the winter. And that's a really fascinating aspect of reptile and amphibian physiology uh, and behavior. And so we're going to talk about that later in the semester. And I had thought that part of what I wanted to do was give you an example of animals hibernating while I was doing that. Um, but by the time we get to that later in the semester, the lizards that we have hibernating in the lab will be up from hibernation. So we're gonna take a little aside today and do a little kind of informal activity with some of the lizards in the lab. Now you'll remember that these lizards are in what family? Lacertidae, yes. And what species are they in the family Lacertidae? You be quiet, no offense. <laughs> What species are they? The common wall lizard, yep. So remember we had a bunch of lizard families we talked about. Remember the family Lacertidae. Do we have any native lizard species from this family in Ohio? No, we don't. Uh, but we do have one species in this family that is what's called invasive or established here, and that is the common wall lizard. And the Latin name for that is Podarsis moralis. And these guys uh, are established in and around Cincinnati. And this is the, the species that we study in the lab extensively. And we actually, there's a population of them up in Columbus as well that we might see later this semester. But that's another story for another day. So these guys are temperate reptile species. Temperate basically means that you're from a climate. This is a good vocabulary word temperate, uh, a climate that gets hot and cold, right? And so Ohio is considered a temperate climate. It's not a tropics, it's not always hot, it's not the Arctic, it's not always cold, it's somewhere in between and has a lot of, what it's characterized by is a lot of variation. And that's really important because that means that the organisms that live here need to be able to survive that variation. So you think about somewhere in the tropics, you think about, I don't know, somewhere nice and tropical near the equator. Think about Hawaii, right? Now, Hawaii, we think of it's always kind of warm. Well, the truth is, in Ohio, it gets much warmer than it does in Hawaii. Uh, and also, as you know, much colder. And so the organisms here need to be able to survive those extreme temperatures, right? And so one of the ways that they do this, one of the, one of the, the mechanisms for the winter is they, they hibernate or brumate, depending on how nuanced you want to get with the definition. And all of that means is that they let themselves get really cold. So reptiles, amphibians are ectothermic. There's a few potential exceptions we'll talk about later, but the lizards we're talking about certainly are. And that means that their, their body temperature depends on the external environment. We've got, this is new, but we haven't actually talked about this explicitly. I guess we did when we gave uh, an overview of reptiles, but let's make sure we have that word too. So ectotherms. I often see students mistakenly uh, use the word exotherm with an X. Uh, that is when you give off heat. It's actually the exact opposite of ectotherm. And we don't use that for animals ever. You only use it in like chemistry when you have a reaction that gives off heat. So don't say exotherm, it's ectotherm. So what these guys do is they let their body temperature get really cold. And in fact, they don't have much of a choice because if you're outside right now in Ohio, not too many places you're gonna go to be warm. And that basically shuts down their metabolism because their metabolism is temperature dependent. Basically, they're not burning any calories. They're not using any energy, so they don't need to take any in. And they just kind of chill. I guess it's the best use of that word uh, for months at a time. I'm just going to keep talking because I thought Princeton would be here by now. And that's kind of all the major points I wanted to make. But I'll just keep going with this because uh, why not? And so what is important to note is that 
they actually have evolved such that they depend on these cold cycles and not not experiencing these cold cycles can actually be really detrimental to their physiology um, because their their hormonal cycles uh, reproductive cycles and other aspects of their metabolism are kind of tied to this warm hot cycle across the seasons now what's really cool about Podarsis moralis is that they can come in and out and up and down in hibernation really quickly so a lot of organisms like for example the snakes around here turtles around here they generally go into hibernation sometime in the fall october november and they're down like a box turtle is going to be buried in the ground for five six months of the year four to six months of the year right and then they'll pop up in the spring and they'll be active and it's kind of like a yes or no kind of thing these wall lizards they kind of constantly come in and out and if there's a sunny day they'll pop up and bask in the middle of december or january I lived in France for two years before I came here in a climate, there's Princeton, uh, pretty similar to here. And I saw lizards out basking every month that I was there for 24 months at some point during a month. I kind of kept track of it because that's what I do. Um, and so they, they're, they're different compared to other animals that hibernate in that they can very uh, quickly and flexibly adjust whether they're cold and inactive or warmer and active. And so Princeton just grabbed these guys from an incubator. They're at six degrees Celsius. Let's go check them out before they warm up. So I think the best thing to do, Princeton, let's do this. Let's put one in the middle of this table here and you hang out there with those guys and we'll bring one and put it on the table over here. And then you guys in the middle can kind of split and look at either side, okay? That's not all right? We're good? Okay, cool, thank you so much. Yeah. So these are some really cold lizards.
they're not, they're not needed. They actually just don't want them to put back out. So once it's twice over, they go out. Oh, how does it look Yes. Well, we can still be the box. I'm also going to ask you all males. Um, and the reason we do that is because we don't want to spread the cases of disease. So if any animal has a lot of cases, we can establish a lot of cases. Well, I felt like we would end up with cases. So do you have to put them in that information because you said that the cases are not on those possible levels? Yeah. So we can also have to find some way to have a way to just all of them. Oh, yeah. Um, I just love uh, it wasn't the mic. It was the group next to mine. I remember that too. I was just losing it into the building. Yeah. Oh, that was the group that was in the building. Do you have orange in that box? You must be in this box. Is there one of the really gray orange belly in the box? Is it 94? I'm not sure. Princeton is orange in 94. It'd be cool to show the different colors. Yeah, 132. I don't remember. Princeton, would you mind going and grabbing the um, two bins with the clip lamps? And actually, would you mind going with Princeton and giving him a hand just bringing those bins over? No problem. And you can set up the 2020 animals in the bin in the lab so you can just leave it there. Does okay. that work for you? Yeah. Cool. Can you come back? I got some questions over here that I'm going to direct you to. I would think you can answer them better than me. Okay. Do you remember that? I, I do. Very I happy they were. So hard to remember. They weren't even that far. <laughs> they were actually 
like still kind of at room temperature. It's great to get a room for that. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, it's it's not just me being angry at all times. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. They're so small, though, it like pinches. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah, it's like you know, They poop on you too often. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not sure exactly what they can take, but it's involved with either the intake of the male or the female. So it has to be either intrasexual competition with other males or being um, attracted. Here, if you touch the lizard or uh, thought about touching the lizard, just go ahead and wash your hands real good with soap and water. Uh, as with Pam and any animal, do that right now. Thank you for that. Oh, no, no, that turns over there. Sorry. Yeah. 
Go ahead and bring it back. I had lots of good questions that I want to answer for the whole class, and a couple that I think Princeton, when he's back here, uh, can answer as well. So one of the questions was, how often do we take them up out of hibernation? And I do it at least once every two weeks while they're hibernating. And we'll bring them up, let them bask for a couple hours, then put them back down. And the reason for that is it kind of simulates uh, what they do in their natural environment, where they're kind of coming in and out of hibernation throughout the winter. And it, it seems to be much better for them, based on my experience, that they kind of get that chance to warm up. We don't feed them at all. Um, we do keep track of their weights. And then at the end of hibernation, they they generally are within a hundredths of a gram of what they started off with. So it's not like a mammal hibernation where they're burning a lot of energy while they're, they're in there. They're just essentially shut down. And you'll see over the course of the next hour that they'll warm up and uh, start becoming active pretty pretty darn quickly. It's cool. Questions? Yeah, Chase, go ahead. Oh, interesting. You should join the lab and do an experiment with that <laughs> next time, uh, next year when, when they're hibernating. Oh, uh, yeah, we can come back. Uh, yeah, that would be a great, I mean, that would be really cool to look at, right, is, is look at how 
you know, how, how their temperature cycles they experience during hibernation affect their body mass, uh, their ability to retain the body mass. Or something like that. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know exactly the answer, but I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever studied that precisely. Yeah. That's a cool experiment idea. Maybe we'll do that. I'll give you credit for it. Um, and I know there's another good question about their toes, but I'm going to save that for Princeton. Lisa, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so we, they're not an all, we find mites when we find these guys in the wild, and that is a fantastic question. I'm going to table that question, uh, because in a couple of weeks, I'm going to present and give you a, the class a presentation about these guys, and I'm going to talk, and I have slides, and I'll show you some more about the mites. So let's just hang on to that one if we could. Yeah. You think, go ahead. Oh, yeah, the mites, they don't have, the, the ones in captivity, they, we actually dip them in peanut oil. Uh, when we first bring them into the lab. And what that does is it, it coats the, um, uh, what's the breathing mechanism for arthropods? Uh, the, the tracheal system of the arthropods, it clogs it up and they all die. Uh, and so, and it, it's totally not, uh, it doesn't hurt the lizard, it's just cooking oil, right? And we just dip them in for a quick second and then we let them sit for a little bit and it knocks off all the mites and kills them. So you can use like pesticides and things like that, but if we can avoid doing that in favor of peanut oil, unless you have a peanut allergy, you're good to go. Yeah, so good. We do. We walk around Cincinnati with like a three meter long fishing poles and we have a little um, slip knot, like a little lasso at the end of the pole and we catch them. And we'll give I'm going to we'll, we'll see this in action and we'll give some demonstrations later in the semester. No, no, we're totally. So, yeah, we we're, we're go to city parks in Cincinnati and people are like, what are you doing? And it's super fun. And then you have to explain it. And then people are like, Oh my gosh, my aunt has those in her backyard and she loves them. And everyone has a story about it and they're super nice and it's fun. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then once you tell people, they're just super nice about it. it from our experience, anyway, people, I don't know, Cincinnati, I don't know if anyone here is from Cincinnati or spends any time there, but I was impressed. They were, they were very cool. Um, all right, there was another question. Any other questions? I wanted Princeton to feel the question about toes, but I'll let him get to that. Eventually. So I think Catherine had a good question about toes. We'll come back to that. Can we hold on to that one too? We'll, McKenna, go ahead. Is the reason for, like, is there like pretty wide variation? Yeah, precisely. So there is some variation naturally, or I guess that's not really the word I want to use, um, if, even if they haven't dropped their tails. But these guys will drop their tails very readily, and the tails will wiggle for a number of minutes after they drop them. And the idea is that, like, if they're being chased by a bird or a cat, the animal gets the predator gets their tail and then tail keeps wiggling keeps them busy while the lizard scurries off and then they can grow a new tail so and we see them in the in the in in their habitats probably about half of them show evidence that at some point their tail was broken and regrown and can you tell that by like there's on a lot of them if you look at the tail where it looks like it might have dropped there's like their color difference or yes like a certain band where you can see there's a difference in like the snake like the bird is yeah, that's precisely it. And the regrown tails are never as long either. So you can look at that too. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, good observation. Yeah, Chase, good. Okay, so now another one about hibernation. So yep. if they were to like, you were to take them out of their hibernation, mm -hmm. and they were to drop their tail and you put it in it, it wouldn't grow back. Or it would. It wouldn't grow back while they're, while they're in a hibernation, or it would be super slow and minimal. Only when they got out and they started getting energy and the metabolism ramped up, would that grow back? I haven't actually tested that with an experiment, but... I can't imagine they'd have the capacity for any growth while they're that cold. Yeah. You got all these good hibernation questions. Go ahead, Chloe. Yeah, you know, the, the, the way the muscle and the bone are structured, they're actually like these break points where it's like a clean break and there's like no or very little blood and it closes up. And I've never heard of that getting infected. Doesn't mean it never happens. But what it does, interestingly, it really affects their ability to run and to maneuver and to climb and things. And they've done some other studies with other species, in fact, that where you can, in some ways, if you're running in a perfectly straight line, you can actually run faster because you just have less weight to carry, right? But they use their tail to maneuver a lot. And so it really reduces their ability to maneuver and to jump. I know there's some work in Anolis. Do you know more about this? These... I know a little bit of it in skinks. So skinks. Like, yeah, they change their, their behavioral pattern or like, they have, I think that it's they have lower escape 
behavior, like a performance. That's yeah. where, like, where they have lower escape performance, having lost their tail. And it, it seems to be beyond just the fact of the, they're getting the tail. It's that they aren't maneuvering as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's yeah. It's really important for yeah. for that. Yeah. Huh. Good question too. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Um, have there been studies on them being in less, like, very, like, areas with less flex traffic because they're Cincinnati, they're busy, they're mm -hmm. busy. But has there been studies on the more rural environments, per se, and how they come about to do that? There have been some studies on them in more naturalistic habitats. Some of the places where we studied them in France were kind of more naturalistic. But there hasn't been work that has, like, directly compared urban and rural populations that are next to each other. However, there's a lot of work on, um, let's say, species of anoles. Uh, in, in, remember, anoles are, anolis is a, a genus within the family um, Iguanidae, and it's super specio, like one of the, I think, the most species genus of vertebrates or something like that. There's like two billion anole species. Anyway, there's a bunch of species that live in Puerto Rico, and there's a group that's been, done a bunch of really nice studies where they, they have studies, they have uh, study populations within a city and then in a rural area right next to the city. And what's cool is they've replicated that across the island at four or five different uh, like paired sites that are urban and rural, and they've compared um, the thermal biology and the morphology of those populations. It's a really nice set of studies, so we can look at that later in the semester. But with Podarsis, that's kind of what we're starting a little bit here, although we don't have the, we don't have the, the natural population here in Ohio. It's all in Cincinnati, so we're just studying them in Cincinnati. But what we can do is they, they have a different kinds of habitat in the city. And what we want to get to is like looking at how that might affect them being in like a really busy area versus more of like a park area or something like that. Yeah. Go ahead, Sid. A lot. Uh, in some studies, again, have have actually quantified that, although I don't think any in Podarsis. But other work with other lizards, it, it takes a lot of energy because they're regrowing all that tissue. They don't regrow the, the bone. It actually, the, the vertebrae that they regrow is all cartilage, so they don't actually uh, reproduce the bone. But it's all the, the, the other tissue and muscle and everything like that they're regenerating. So, yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed one of the individuals in this part of the um, and it's like the bone that was blacked out a little bit. Uh -huh. um, is there any reason for that? Like, did that have to do with them trying to maximize the surface areas like where light is in them? Like, they, the they do exactly that while they're basking. If they're really cold in doing that, I'm not sure exactly what's going on. But um, while they're basking, they can change not only where they are moving around in space, but they can change their posture and, and change their body shape to maximize that absorption. You're exactly right. You guys are good. This is good. Yeah, that's exactly what they do. Prince, we got a toe question for you. Yes, great question. All right, so their fourth toe on their hind feet is like really long, as you notice, right? And so a lot of work has been done to like sort of, you know, like come up with a reason as to why that is. And some of the work has shown that basically that toe helps in their sprinting, especially. And so like, for instance, it, it um, I don't exactly remember what it does, but, but, but basically I know that, you know, the longer the toe, the better these print performances. And so that's why they sort of selected for this, like very, very long back toe. And some of Princeton's work actually looks at the shape of the claw on that toe and looks for how the shape of that claw affects their ability to climb and to cling. And he's gonna talk more about that soon. Yeah. All right, these are great questions about Podarsis. We could have the whole semester on Podarsis, uh, which maybe I'll do that in the future, just change herpetology to Podarsis class. Um, we're going to come back to these guys a lot. So in the in favor of kind of keeping us moving with some other things, let's transition now uh, back to this. But uh, uh, yeah, great questions. And then at the end of class, we'll go and look at these guys again and see how feisty they are once they've had a chance to warm up. So I want to review for your ticket out on Monday. I asked you some questions uh, specifically about lizards. And I want to make sure that we have good understanding of the answers. And so the first question was, from which of the following families could we find the most species here in Ohio? 
Most of you, in fact, picked uh, skink, skink, uh, I can't say it, uh, since today. Um, and you are, in fact, correct there. So make sure you remember that there's three species from this family in Ohio. The other families, there's no chameleons. There is one invasive gecko-ish. There is the uh, Scoloporus undulatus, which is an iguanidae, and then Podarsis muralis and Lacerdidae. So most of you got that right. Second question is, which family includes species that were not native to Ohio, but have been introduced? And so most of you, again, got this right. It's uh, geckos and lacertids. There's no introduced uh, iguanas here that I know of. There's one uh, native species, and there's no chameleons here in Ohio. As fun as that would be uh, to go out and find chameleons, uh, we don't have them here. Next question is, which family or families includes lizard species that are native to Ohio? And the correct answer here, remember, is Iguanidae, Scoloporus undulatus, and the skinks. There's three species of skinks. There's no native chameleons. I was actually a little bit surprised that about a quarter of you picked chameleons were native to Ohio. There's no geckos native, and there's no lacertids native. I'm going to pause there, make sure that's making sense so far, see what questions you have. Well, would you mind getting the lights again? I think that's actually better for the presentation to be able to see. Okay. Then the other question, which family includes the largest lizards in the world? I goofed and I didn't give you the correct answer, which is Varanidae. Remember, that's the family that includes monitor lizards uh, and goannas. So make sure you've got that one. I apologize for not giving you the correct option there. And then the last question is, which group or groups is monophyletic? By and large, we got this, but it wasn't as perfect as a response as I hope. So fortunately, nobody picked Herps or lizards as being monophyletic, good. Most of you picked amphibians as being monophyletic, but remember mono, amphibians are monophyletic, that's a clade. Snakes are also monophyletic, that's a clade. Um, squamates is also monophyletic. So squamates, remember, includes all snakes and lizards and amphibians. So if we talk about squamates as a whole, that group is monophyletic. When we refer to lizards, quotation mark, that's paraphyletic with respect to snakes and amphibians. So nobody picked the two answers that weren't correct, but I was hoping to see a little bit higher percentage of people getting the uh, answers that were correct. I'm going to pause there. I just wanted to review that, make sure it makes sense, see what questions you have about that. All right, next step for class is going to be to finish up our our lecture on extant reptiles. Um, and I think before we do that, looking at the time, I think what we'll do is take our quick uh, break right now instead. So let me go and find our extremely important cute slide of a turtle stretching. And let's take, a, let's take five and come back and then I will finish up uh, talking about reptile diversity. All right, let's talk about turtles. So this is exciting. You have seen this slide like uh, probably six times now. Extant reptiles, maybe remember we have four major groups. Remember that there's only one species of Tuatara. Uh, there's a couple dozen crocodilians. There's three, 400-ish turtles. And there's 10,000 plus lizards, snakes, and amphibians in Squamata. And so today's focus is going to be to Sudanese or turtles. Uh, there's, this is 351. There's a few more now. I think they've identified a few since then. So it's, you, you don't know these numbers off the top of your head, do you? No, they're, they're no. Always... Yeah, it's always, so the important thing is 350-ish species of turtles. So a good number of turtles. Now, just to go back, we've all seen this figure a whole bunch of times now. You should be able to close your eyes and redraw this from memory at this point or, or pretty soon. You probably have dreams about the terrestrial vertebrate phylogeny. Has anyone done that? Really? No? You have. You did. Yes. That's awesome, Catherine. I'm so glad. You just made my day. Okay. And so remember, here we're talking about turtles. And remember, turtles, along with their closest living relatives, the crocodilians and the birds, are together known as the Archilosauria. This is the group that includes turtles, birds, and crocodilians. Now, there's a whole bunch of other prehistoric animals that are now extinct that are in this group as well. So it used to be actually quite a bit more diverse than it is now, especially uh, in the crocodilia lineage. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in the semester. 
But for now, I just want to make sure you understand this relationship. So birds, uh, the sparrow that you see out at the feeder is more closely related to a Galapagos tortoise than that tortoise is to a lizard or a snake. So keep that in mind as we're talking about this case. So turtles, there are 11 species in Ohio uh, all together. There's two suborders. I'll talk about those in a second uh, that are broken down into 14 families. Uh, the takeaway message here is that they're a lot more diverse than they're often given credit for. Sid, go ahead. Um, this one? You should have this memorized by now. No, I just forget the... Okay. Okay, that's cool. I'll give you, I'll give you a pass on that one. Yeah, of course. Um, the takeaway message is that they're really diverse. We have, of course, sea turtles that live their entire lives without coming to shore or very seldom coming to shore, except for females nesting sometimes. We have terrestrial uh, turtles. We have terrestrial tortoises. And we, uh, we even have, uh, this is a pancake tortoise. These guys live in arid environments and they kind of squeeze between rocks and things like that. Um, we also have a lot of freshwater turtles. Um, that live in uh, ponds and lakes and rivers, especially here in Ohio and other temperate climates. Um, so the takeaway message is that they can be aquatic and terrestrial. One commonality is that they're all oviparous. So we talked about, for example, with squamates that there were a lot of variation. There was a lot of oviparous and a lot of viviparous species. All turtles lay eggs. All turtles also have a shell. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the parts of the shell in a slide coming up. What I want you to know here is the top part of the shell is called the carapace, and the bottom part that you can't see, you can kind of see it in the sea turtle, is called the plastron. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. They also have a, a variety of limb morphology depending on what they're doing. So terrestrial tortoises, like you picture a Galapagos tortoise, they have these big stubby feet that are almost like elephant-like, versus aquatic uh, turtles, which can have web feet that are, um, are, are good for swimming, or in the case of sea turtles, they have just flippers instead of appendages, or instead, not, excuse me, not instead of appendages, instead of digits, they have just a, a full on flipper. So lots of variation there. Note that they're divided into two suborders, and the way we break them into their suborder is depending on how they pull their neck back into their shell, which is a really interesting distinction. On one side, we have something called the side neck turtles, or pleurodira. These guys, when they retract their head and their, their head into their shell, their neck actually kind of turns to the side and, the, the, and that allows the head to move back. So it forms this like S-shaped curve of the neck. These guys often have quite long necks as well. On the other hand, we have cryptodira, which are turtles that pull their heads straight back into the shell. And in this case, the neck vertebrae are forming an angle along this plane. So this is looking at the turtle from the side. So they're moving, basically the neck vertebrae is moving in up and down rather than side to side to retract the head back into the shell. So that's the big split amongst the two groups of turtles. Um, and we'll talk more about some of the families here in just a second. But I want to make sure you know the difference between Pleurodira and Cryptodira. All of the turtles in Ohio are in Cryptodira. They're all, um, in that group. Um, I've always heard that the uh, pair of Pheromyra as like the, the soft shell turtle is cool. Is that correct? Is that not? Uh, it is not. There, there's some. Um, let me think. What we have is soft shell turtles in North America are all in Cryptodira. Um, are there other soft shell turtles in Pleurotira? I'm not sure, but I don't think so off the top of my head. Yeah, I think the soft shells are all okay. in here. Yeah. Hmm? Snapping, turtles really on the left. snapping turtles are not snapping turtles, are still in Cryptodira. Yeah. So, if all the ones in Ohio are Cryptodira, what yep. are some examples of? Pro deer, yeah, there, yeah, Africa and Asia. There's a lot of like freshwater turtles in Africa and Asia. Um, so, yeah, they have these. They some can have these really long necks. Yeah, I don't know if there's any. I'm not 100 percent sure if there's any in South America. I'd have to look that up. Are there? Yeah, I'd have to look that up. I'm not sure, but there's a number of species in uh, like the tropics of Asia. Okay. Ooh, is there a reason for it? Yes, 
I don't know what the reason is. It could have to do with just like where those groups happen to emerge evolutionarily and where they've been distributed since then. I don't know if there's like a specific like environmental selective pressure that makes it disadvantageous for pleura deer to be in North America. Uh, I wouldn't even, I don't, I don't know. So there's some reason. Uh, it could be, in, and that would be some combination of their evolutionary history. And then if there's any selective pressures that are kind of shaping where these guys are in the, in the globe. That's a great question. I never thought about it like that. Sam, go ahead. Yeah, totally. Let's check this out. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So this is a good example. Of a snapping turtle. Let's pull this guy down. Thank you, Sam. I'm just going to stand over here again so I can get it on the camera for the recording. So, this is a snapping turtle shell. He doesn't normally stand like this, he's normally like this. And you can see how the neck is curved so that when he retracts his head, it's bending in this um, kind of the vertical plane rather than the horizontal plane, like this, rather than a side neck. And I don't think I have any side neck turtles. You would actually know, Mason, from your. Did you do a project with turtles on these in invertebrate anatomy? I did. I was looking up their uh, Yeah. Do we have any side neck? Do you remember from that project? Not from Yeah, I don't think we do. I have to look in the museum here and see if we have any. I should do that. Hmm? Sorry. Oh, I have a question. I thought that the preferred iron snakes their necks into their shell. I'm not sure what you mean like, by. Like, Well, they don't retract it straight back. It kind of curves and kind of fits underneath the carapace there. I mean, they can they can tuck it in pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Say so the South America. They are in South America then. Yeah, largely Australia, South America, and Africa. Africa. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. There are some in Asia too, but I guess when I think about it, they're geomitids mostly in Asia freshwater turtles. So yeah, that would be in a different family. Oh, good, thank you. Okay, perfect. Good. Let's talk about the shell a little more. Um, uh, the turtle shell is kind of what they're famous for, and it's been relatively unchanged in terms of its morphology for several hundred million years, which is kind of cool. And what's important to note is that the the shell is a modified rib cage in vertebral column, meaning that the shell is made of bone, and it's it's basically over. Uh, it's basically what forms ribs and vertebrae and other vertebrates. Those same bone structures form the shell of the turtle, and then that bony shell is covered over with these hard keratinized scutes or scales. And what's cool about turtles is they're the only vertebrates where their shoulder and pelvic girdles are kind of inside their rib cage. So picture your clavicle and your scapula here, right? Your shoulder girdle. Picture that moving and migrating so that it's inside your rib cage and your ribs are outside of your shoulder girdle. And also then you have ribs outside of your pelvic girdle as well. So that's basically what's happening with turtles. However, they cannot leave their shell. They can't leave their shell, um, contrary to many, many cartoons. And also important to note that both the, the top shell, the carapace, and the bottom shell, the plastron, have nerve endings. And so they're actually very sensitive. If you touch a turtle lightly, it will notice. And so if you go and take a pen knife and carve your initials in the turtle, because you're a jackass, the turtle will also notice. So don't do that either. Um, but it's important to note that they, they, it is sensitive. Some, uh, there's kind of a myth that this is like dead tissue or something like that. Um, I will talk more about some of the arrangements of the scale, the scutes. I'm going to save that for another time. But basically, all of the, the scutes of the carapace and the vertebrate have specific names. Um, but we don't need to get into that right now. I'll save that for another day. You can go. So I've done some work with marking raw turtles before. Uh huh. And for that, we use the marginal scutes. The marginal scutes. Yep. You probably who who has done the the painted turtle lab in one twenty two, right? You, you've done that. You've, if you mark, what do you use to mark them in there? A file? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it hurts. It hurts the animal. Oh, yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah, I mean, it's not terrible and they heal and they're fine in the long term. What's that? Oh, uh, the shell and the margins. The very end of it is probably fine, but if you get into the bone at all, yeah, I'm sure it hurts. Yeah. I mean, everything we do to these animals hurts. We can't fool ourselves and say that it doesn't. 
but I mean, we, we just want to minimize that, right? So, yeah. So the shoulder girdle is the container called the girdle is literally underneath the shell. Exactly, yeah, and you can see it really nicely in those specimens here or, or up there or right here. Like this is the shoulder girdle right here, these bones, mm -hmm. the collarbone and the, and the scapula, and it's and inside so the shell. The shell acts like a vertebral column, essentially. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of the vertebral column, and basically, the bones of the shell are essentially like widened, kind of specialized rib bones almost. And so it's, it's a kind of continuous vertebrae where we have like the cervical and the lumbar. Precisely. Yep, they're, they're in, um, um, analogous. Mm -hmm. so, and homologous, actually, too. They're both. Mm -hmm. can, you, can, you, can you show that again to hold it up? I can't see it. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Here. Yeah, no, and I can actually, let me get another one down, you can take it closer. I think it's important to be able to see, and I forget sometimes that we have all these resources in this classroom. The whole reason I had this class uh, taught in this classroom is so I could use these specimens, and I've been forgetting that they're here sometimes. So take a close look at this guy, too. You can see his color, and his shoulder girdles are inside. That right. That's a, the knee joint. Well, the very, the outside layer of it is going to be some scutes, some like keratinized um, scales, but uh, oh, the shell itself is bone, yeah, absolutely. Same thing, yep, the outer layer is keratin, but then underneath it is all bone. All right, so let's talk a little about uh, families in turtles. So there's a lot of turtle families. But I want to show you a picture first of, of the most important turtle family. Uh, we used to, I'm not making this up, we used to get portraits, like we used to go to like this the portrait studio with our turtles every year and get like a picture of, of us with our pet turtles and then send it out for our holiday cards. And then my son was born, he kind of ruined it because then if you send a card with the, your pet turtles but not your kid at holidays, people think you're weird. So this is the first one when he was like four months old. And that's our pet turtle, Kirk. I thought you'd all appreciate that. All right, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I never even thought about that. No, Kirk, no, that's really funny though. No, Kirk is actually named after um, the character in the Gilmore Girls. You know Kirk from Gilmore, because, because he gets a cat and he names his cat, Cat Kirk. When his name is Kirk, and we thought that was hilarious, so we got a turtle. And his full name is Turtle Kirk, but yeah, I should clarify that. But yeah, that's a good Star Trek reference. I didn't even pick up on that. No, it's Gilmore Girls. It trumps it. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad I told everyone that now. Okay, <laughs> families that we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on just six of these families: Collidridae, um, uh, Coloniidae, Amidae, Testudinidae, Trinicidae, and Kinosternidae. And these are wait, Collidridae. Yep, that's right. These are the families we're going to focus on for turtles. I want to make sure I had that right. Uh, and three of these families uh, will find species here in Ohio. So let's talk about uh, Kelonia Day. Uh, this is commonly called sea turtles, with the exception of the leatherback. The leatherbacks have their own family, uh, Dermochelidae. Yes, question. Will say? Yes. Yep. Oh, uh, where are we? This one, no, this one, no, this one, this one. You don't want this one. You sure? Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's funny, J the, James is now, he's 13 now. He's like a full-on teenager, so it's funny to see him as a little dinker like that. Kirk is not, unfortunately. He, he, he lived a long, happy life, but he is uh, no longer... With us. So, we have we have a we we used well we we have right now we have um we have six pet turtles now we have dusty winnie frankie tim and then the other two the names of the other two are a little bit controversial so i won't mm, skippy and mappy. yeah skippy and mappy the other yeah or bumpy and snips or i don't know <laughs> yeah there's 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 a lot there was a lot of debate about some of the turtle names in our we have four box turtles, and then we have a, a map turtle and a, a musk turtle. Musky, yeah, he's cute. 
All right, so let's talk about sea turtles. The example I'm giving you here is uh, Colonia Midas, the green sea turtle, probably, uh, I think the most common, if not one of the most common sea turtles. Um, they live exclusively in marine environments, meaning um, oceans or seas, I guess, saltwater environments. And they have specialized glands to remove the excess salt um, from, their, from their system to keep their electrolyte balance in check. Um, what I want to focus on here is they have, uh, they're, they're generally speaking, they're, they're no, always speaking, their forelimbs are more developed than their hind limbs, and they're these full paddles. And the hind limbs are basically like steering rudders, like they don't really propel themselves uh, much, if at all, with their hind limbs, but their, their front flippers are what's doing all the work when they're swimming. When they get on land, as you've probably all seen, they're very slow and they can't even like hold up their own body weight. And, and in fact, they very seldom come on land with the very important exception of females coming up to lay their eggs on beaches. Um, those females generally return to the same breeding area year after year, and often that's the same beach where they were themselves were born. Um, overall, sea turtles are omnivorous, but different species have different specializations in their diet. And then as I mentioned, this is this family is all of the sea turtles with the exception of the leatherbacks. They're in their own their own lineage. Go ahead, Sam. Why do they have to go back on land? Okay, great question. Why do they have to go back on land to eggs? Because the answer is that they're reptiles and reptilian eggs need to be they they, they won't develop that that I can think of any exceptions if they're submerged in water. And so they they're specialized in every way to do everything else out in the water, but uh the eggs need to be on land and especially in the marine environment I imagine it'd be very challenging for the egg to develop in that marine environment that's follow a good question quick quick follow up question. Mm -hmm. yeah do we know if any marine like prehistoric marine reptiles also did that i'm assuming they probably did oh if they if they came ashore to lay their eggs i don't know if time ahead i'd be surprised if they didn't a lot of them give live births so like sea snakes that live their entire lives out in, in the sea they just give uh live birth i think without any are there any oviparous sea snakes I don't know if there are any of the first sea snakes, but there are some yeah. crates that actually come on land to they, give birth as well. Yeah. Birth. And they give live birth on land? I, the think, so. I think they do too, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. I was just saying there's one sea turtle that has its eggs in water all the time. Wait, what? Yeah. Well, it's not a sea turtle, it's uh, freshwater. Okay. It's the hog nose. Yeah, oh, the fly river turtle. Yeah. yeah, what they do is they lay their eggs in dry land on the river. This is super cool, actually. And it's on the riverbanks, and the rivers flood seasonally. And so the eggs develop like on the riverbank where it's dry. And then at the time when they're basically fully developed is when the river rises. And then the water submerges the nest, and the turtles, the embryos, or they're not embryos at that point, they're the, the turtles in the egg at that point. Can detect that and that's when they hatch out and bust out of their shell because those guys are entirely aquatic too yeah and that's yeah they need that water these yeah, that's a great call i forgot about that system yeah the fly river turtles that's the genus um oh what are those guys called i can't think of it off the top of my head but it's the only turtle it's only fresh water that has paddles, though. yeah they're, they're they basically look like little baby sea turtles they're awesome uh, a couple questions lisa go ahead A, did you say a beak? Yeah, basically all, I mean, all turtles have a beak. So turtles don't have teeth um, and they have this, this um, very sharp uh, keratinized um, beak. Uh, try to think, of, no, there's no exception to that. Yeah, they all have beaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not just sea turtles. Yes, it. Sea turtles? Yeah. I don't know. They would be in estuaries and things like that. Sure. Okay. I don't I see know, why not. I know for sharks, like, if they have to have an incredibly developed way to get rid of the salt and then also make sure that they're healthy if they go in brackish water. Yeah. So, if turtles kind of the same way, but I don't know if it's like they have to have a lot of water to make sure that they're I'm not sure exactly, but I don't see why they couldn't be in brackish water. I don't know. They should be fine. And, and some actually, like, Sea snakes actually depend on freshwater, even though they never come ashore. And what they'll do is when it rains, they'll go up to the surface of the ocean and drink that thin layer of rainwater off the surface before it mixes and becomes salty. So they, they have these cool ways to get that fresh water, even in the marine environment. I don't, turtles, I don't think, do that, that I know of anyway. But uh, Let's talk about uh, Testudinidae. 
These are what we call tortoises. Um, the example here I have is a Galapagos tortoise. There's a bunch of species in, uh, of Galapagos tortoises. They're quite famous and big. Uh, they have this very domed carapace. They have a plastron that uh, doesn't have a hinge, so it's just um, a rigid plastron. They have these big elephantine rear legs. They don't have any uh, webbing between their toes or anything like that because they're, they, they can swim. Actually, these guys, they can live for a long time uh, floating in water. They're not terribly good swimmers, but they can float and hang out in water for a long time. Um, and these guys are herbivorous. So the Galapagos tortoises, that group, depending on how you want to break them up into different species, which is a little bit controversial, um, are the largest uh, terrestrial turtles, the largest tortoises, followed by the Aldabra tortoise out in the Indian Ocean, um, and then the um, African spur thighed tortoise, Socata tortoises, is the third biggest tortoise group. So some of them get really large, but don't be fooled, there are little tortoises too. There's like um, Russian tortoises, for example, uh, can be like this big when they're fully grown and they're, uh, they're in the same group there. So these guys are marked by being terrestrial, almost entirely terrestrial uh, and herbivorous. And they have these adaptations to go with having a uh, entirely or, or almost entirely terrestrial life. A couple more. I've got kind of stern today. Kind of my favorite. They're super cute. This is Sternotherus odoratus. Uh, these guys have a very broad geographic range across the eastern U.S. Um, they are known as the common musk turtle or the eastern musk turtle. I'll go back in a second, Sid. Um, there is one species here in Ohio in this group, and that's this guy here. Um, they're also, uh, we have mud turtles too. Uh, they look similar to musk turtles, but they're kind of a separate lineage within the same family. They're called musk turtles because they release, uh, some of them can release a musk, like a foul smelling odor from their cloacal area when they're disturbed. They are uh, aquatic, although they will come out and roam around on land sometimes. Uh, they have these cool tubercles on their chin here. Um, and interestingly, these guys, their closest relatives, their sister taxa is the sea turtles. And so those are the, the closest living relatives to sea turtles are turtles in this mud and musk turtle family, at least as, as far as the most recent information I have on the turtle uh, relationships, unless that's new at all, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Kind of stern today. They're generally pretty small. These guys are, are not big animals. We have some of these guys in a jar or somewhere too. I'm going to go back to the Testudinidae slide for you for a second. Let's see, we got a couple more turtle families here. Bless you. All right, I want to go ahead and go to Collidridae. So this is your snapping turtles. We do have one species here in Ohio, and that is this guy, Collidra serpentina, the common snapping turtle. These guys uh, can get pretty big. Uh, sna common snapping turtles, and especially alligator snapping turtles. I don't, know if, I don't Do any of the zoos in Ohio have alligator snapping turtles? They're they're big. They're big. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, it's important to note here they have a reputation as being really feisty and mean, um, and that is because I like this this phrase they're defensively aggressive. Snapping turtles when they're in water, I've never heard of anyone getting injured or anything, or even like a turtle being remotely aggressive when they're in the water. They will run away from you uh, and they're in the water. On land, however, they are formidable foes. If you mess with one, if it's crossing the sea or something, it will bite. They are big and they have big heads and they will um, they will injure you for sure. So you have to be very mindful around these guys. I know some people are think that like, oh, if they're like that on land, they might be like that in water and they're afraid to go swimming or skinny dipping or something like that in a pond with snapping turtles. You're cool. Other stuff might happen to you, but the snapping turtles won't bother you. They have really long tails and I should have put a slide up. They have this really reduced plastron. Actually, I can show you. Macy, would you mind holding up that turtle and just showing us his plastron? You can see there, 
how small the plastron is relative to the carapace. So there's this really small plastron. And musk turtles have a similar reduced plastrons as well. Um, that's all I want to say about snapping turtles. Yeah? Is the gas exchange unique to or no? Say again? Is gas exchange unique to or no? Gas exchange? Yeah. You mean like? When they're, when they're underwater for the winter, they'll bury in the mud uh -huh. and exchange gases so they can breathe. Through, I mean, all turtles exchange gases. I'm not sure if I understand your question right, because gas exchange is like through the water. Like yeah. The water. Yeah, these guys know a lot of freshwater turtles can do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ethan's asking about gas exchange not through the lungs, right? Is that what you mean? I believe it's. I don't think it's through the lungs. Yeah. So it's actually, and I'll talk about this later. But a lot of freshwater turtles, they can um, the 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 commonly said phrase is they can breathe through their butts, and that's actually partially true. They can they can exchange oxygen carbon dioxide through the soft tissue around their cloaca and around their mouth. Mm -hmm. And these guys, I believe can too, snapping turtles? Yeah. They can too. So they can they can uh, respire minimally. And, and some species like painted turtles actually will hibernate underwater for four or five months at a time without coming up to breathe. So it's really remarkable. I've got SK and McKenna with questions here. This is, yep, yep. Thanks for asking that one. And these guys have a huge geographic range and are in fact invasive in a lot of places around the world too, in California um, and some other, I'm not sure. They're not in like Japan and stuff. Are they in Europe, these guys? I don't know. Oh. Yeah, they've spread though, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I was going to say they might be in Europe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I've got McKenna and then Sam and Catherine's question. Yep. Yeah, I can put that on, sure. Yep, yep. And Sam, go ahead. In uh, the Colladridae family? Yeah, they're not very good. Their shells are reduced in their, they have kind of giant heads, so they can't like hide in their shell like a box turtle can. And I'll show you a box turtle. I have a video of a box turtle. I'll, I'll have to play that next time. I don't have it handy. Catherine, go ahead. They can get, oh gosh, I mean like a, a full grown female common snapping turtle. Its shell can be like that big around. They're big old, big old beasties, yeah. The are... Yeah, the alligator snapping turtle can get, I mean, their carapace can get like that or so. And they're like, they're as sizable as some sea turtles even. They're like huge. Yeah. Sam, go ahead and Chris. So I did look at it because you were wondering where like other places that snapping turtles are? Yes. And you, you said you mentioned Japan. There are snapping turtles in Japan. There are, yeah. They are invasive. Okay. Um, apparently, it's it's the classic, people got them as pets and then they escaped to establish population. Totally, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know necessarily if it's common snapping turtle specifically. When I looked it up, there was an article about an alligator snapping turtle that was apparently in uh, Kyushu, which was one of the Huh, that's kind of surprising because they're not in the pet trade, really. Not the above ground pet trade, anyway. Huh. Interesting. Apparently, there have been invasive snapping turtles there since the 1960s. In Japan? Yeah. Huh. And the red eared sliders I know are in Japan, too. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Huh. Thanks, Sam. Well, there's a lot of animals that people should. That's a different story. Chris, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, okay. So Chris is, I'm really glad you're asking that. So there is a bit of a, of a, um, both truth and danger to that. So if you pick up a snapping turtle by the base of the tail, you can hold it without it getting, uh, tagging you. But it's really bad for the turtle because their vertebrae and that their, their muscular, uh, musculature and their bone structure there is not built to support their weight from this rear point, And you can injure them pretty bad by doing that. So it's safe for you, but really bad for the turtle. And so really the best way to handle them is actually to grab them from the rear edge of either carapace, um, and I shouldn't say either carapace, either side of the carapace, and you can kind of hold them that way and hold the head away from you, and they won't be able to reach their head around and try to get you. Yeah, yeah but we're not going to do that. In, we're not going to handle any snapping turtles, unless they're cute little babies. We, did we ever see, did we see a snapping turtle down on the run? No, we saw map turtles and painted turtles. Yeah, OK. Um, let, me get, let me get Catherine and then Sam. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, what do these guys eat? I remember seeing a snapping turtle that was 
Yes, they're mostly um, sit and wait ambush predators, but they'll eat they'll eat vegetation. They'll eat um, they they'll eat crustaceans and vertebrates. They'll eat vertebra like they'll eat pretty much everything. Um, they'll scavenge if there's like a carcass or something. So we saw a snapping turtle this summer at um, not Krauss Preserve. What's the other Owu Preserve? Uh, yeah, we saw a cool snapping turtle there. That was that was that was fun. I did. I, I looked up another Good. place. Uh, this one is not one where they have like established invasive populations, uh -huh. but it's also very funny because there was apparently two years ago a problem of alligator snapping turtles again in France. Really? Not not an established population, but apparently uh, two years ago, people in Toulouse were warned about a bunch of alligator snapping turtles that were in a river nearby. Really. I lived right near Toulouse two years ago. That's really funny. And that's just the huh. of snapping turtles in Europe. And the first article that came up was residents in Toulouse. Toulouse, France, have been alerted to watch out for some unusual reptiles. Wow, that's <laughs> spotted on the nearby Canal de Midi. Oh yeah, I know where that is. Huh. Yeah, you introduced the alligator snapping turtles. <laughs> said, go ahead. So for guys who are snapping turtles in Italy, they don't like South Carolina. The alligator snapping turtles they're like known to uh these guys are really good at it okay. so different different groups can definitely extend their necks to different lengths and some of them have very very long like there's turtles called snake neck turtles and they have these really their their necks are basically as long as their bodies these guys do have really long flexible necks too um so they're on the the high end of the neck length uh measurement or the neck length scale there we go we'll call it that uh all right let's talk about trinicidae so these are your soft shell turtles we have uh two species here in ohio ohio um they're in the genus uh apolloni uh this is apolloni spinifera the eastern spiny soft shell turtle uh they formerly were in the genus trionix but that got changed uh i don't know five ten years ago or something like that these guys are fully aquatic um, and they have they have feet with digits. They don't have flippers, but they have these wide. They can extend their toes out and their their webs. So they're really good. Um, they're really good at moving in the water. And they have these flat, thin bodies. And their shell is very like leathery. It's not a hard carapace like all of the other species I've showed you so far. Um, and they have the the part of the part of what comes with having that um, softer shell is they have reduced bone in the shell. So you see the specimens we have here where the entire carapace is composed of bone. In the soft shell turtles, there's some bone in there, but a lot of it is just soft tissue. And so they're actually really, they move kind of this weird way. They actually kind of run along the bottom of the river. They kind of run swim and they can be super fast. Uh, they can get pretty sizable too, if anyone's seen them around. I haven't, I haven't seen one in Ohio yet. I've seen them in other places. Go ahead, Lisa. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, so these guys are a good example. You can see, you can kind of see in the picture of these long extended snout with these two uh, nares, the nasal openings at the very end. And that's because what they'll do is they'll hang out in shallow water at the bottom. And then every once in a while, they'll stick their head up and just enough so those little the two little nares just stick out of the water and they can breathe and they'll come back down lots of other turtle species like in the family i'm about to show you they'll they're more active some reason they're more hang out on the surface and they'll just come up and breathe so they don't have uh, this kind of long extended snout and there's other turtle species that have a similar snout like that too like the fly river turtles have that and um is there another group that has that well there's other examples of that too yeah. i'll make it uh kate go ahead Oh, well, I like funny stories about. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, up at my friend's like, house in like, Michigan, like they have uh, a little further down from them, somebody with a beach, and a bunch of the eastern tiny soft shells who like crawl up there and lay their eggs, and you can see them like digging in the sand. Oh, that'd be and cool. Then, like when you watch them run back into the water, it's really funny. It's so fast. They're just like <laughs> skip along. Yeah, they're really they're neat. They're they're kind of like lizards with like big flat backs or something almost. 
I, I saw one nesting once. It's really cool. So they come up and they nest in like the sandbars and things like that in rivers. Um, and that's that will come up. But otherwise, they don't really get out much. They don't do much basking, maybe a little bit, but not too much. Yeah, it could. I mean, it's not as protective, but you have to think about the trade off with these guys. You know, what advantages does it give? And one that it gives for these guys is it's really flat, so it's more, um, I don't say aerodynamic, but uh, what's the word for aerodynamic in water? Hydrodynamic. Hydrodynamic, thank you, yeah. Um, and then they just, they kind of going with their change in morphology, they have changes in lifestyle that allow them to basically not need that kind of protective shell. And these guys, they move really quickly. And so like a box turtle is not going to escape from any potential predator because they're, they're not, they're just not moving that fast, but they can close up in their shell. And actually that's on my next slide, but these guys can zip away from potential predators. So it's all, it's all about that trade-off in, in, in between form and function. Yeah, it's a good question. We'll talk more about that. Princeton's going to talk more about that later in the semester. All right, this is the last family we've got at my today. So this is a really speciose group. Um, and it's basically your pond uh, box and water turtles. So it's a lot of the freshwater turtles across North America. Uh, a good, uh, very conspicuous example is the painted turtle. I've got the Midland painted turtle here, but also the Eastern painted turtle. And then of course, the greatest species that's ever uh, wandered this fine planet, Terrapini Carolina, the Eastern box turtle. You can see a male there. Uh, we have these guys in Ohio. Actually, uh, we saw one a couple summers ago at a park in Cincinnati. And it was really uh, pretty neat to see them. Um, most species in this family are more aquatic, like your painted turtle. They have kind of flattened shells. They have webbed feet. Uh, they come out. You see, these are the turtles that you see basking on logs and rocks and stuff like that along the shores. Uh, there's lots of them here in Delaware, even. Um, some of you that have done the turtle trapping lab know that there's a pond behind the middle school. These guys can live in like the murkiest, crappiest, polluted water. It's kind of amazing uh, where they can still hang on and live in these tiny bodies of goopy water, and you'll find uh, painted turtles. The box turtles are really cool uh, for among other reasons because their their plastron is hinged, meaning they can actually close it up. And I have a video of one getting attacked by a raccoon that I'll show you next class. Um, but they can close up entirely so that there's no like even a, like a, a crafty little raccoon can't get his little paw in between that crack, and they can just they just seal up, and they can basically just wait out whatever predator. And there's very few predators that can do much with a box turtle when it's closed up. Maybe a coyote or something. But even then, they're they're really well protected. Um, and that's the last family I want to talk about. That's all that that covers. I know it's a brief. As with all of this so far, it's been a very brief overview of uh, diversity of reptiles and amphibians, and that covers turtles. Chase, go ahead. Yep. Yep. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The desert tortoise is out in the southwest. There's a couple different species, and they're they're uh, they're they're very um, protected. They're in, they're endangered, mm -hmm. and they they yeah. If you what a lot of these guys do, if you pick them up, they'll pee on you, which, you know, if you're living in a pond or something, then you just drink again. But in desert tortoise, obviously, that, that liquid is pretty precious, so you don't want to risk them doing that. Yeah, desert tortoise are neat. Sid, go ahead. Uh, are the only Not entirely. There's some other turtles, actually, that have a hinge on their, um, their carapace, where the carapace actually hinges. They're... Uh, it's called hingeback turtles, I think, actually, now I think about it. I can't think of the name of the family off the top of my head. Um, but there are other groups that can do that, too. Mm -hmm. uh, if you stuck a freshwater turtle inside of salt water, would it die? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to do that experiment. I don't know how Yeah. I don't know how long it would take and all of that, but uh, yeah. 
All right, so what I would like to do now is, let's see here. I wanted to spend the rest of the class with just kind of a, a workshop, but we don't really have too much time for that. What we'll do is I'll just wrap things up now. We've got 15 minutes left. Uh, what I'd encourage you to do is take a look at the lizards now that they're hot. Um, and then if you have any questions about the primary literature assignment, I'm happy to go over that with you. Remember, this is due Monday. Uh, on the PDF of the assignment is a link to a Google a form. On that form, you're going to copy and paste the link to your Google Doc, and that's how we'll do it. That way, uh, it's easy for us to look at it and give you feedback through the Google Docs. It kind of keeps everything a little more organized. We'll then have a chance to make some revisions on this, and we'll, we'll work on that through the following week. So otherwise, I am going to just wrap up the presentation. Oh, one other quick announcement. A couple other. Remember, you have a class program for Monday. I'll let you read the comic first. It's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, you remember you have a bunch of assignments for Monday, including the reading on salamander genomes, as well as a primary literature assignment. And finally, just a quick uh, heads up office hours or open hours are usually on Mondays from 12 to 2. I only could do it one to two this week. We have this like university wide thing I have to go to from have to I get to go to uh, from 12 to 1 next Monday. So I just have an hour of open hours next week. Monday, of course, if you have questions or whatever. Don't hesitate to drop me a line. Super excited for Monday because Dr. Mason is going to start us off thinking about venom uh, and, and what it is and what it does and its evolutionary and ecological significance. It's going to be like the best two weeks of the semester. So be here Monday. Now, I've really talked it up, so no pressure. Cool. Check out this hot lizards before you go.